Okay, hello everybody. Welcome to the NASA Earth Data webinar, Share Data with OpenDAP Hyrax, New Features and Improvements. This is your host, Jennifer Brennan. We do appreciate your feedback on the two optional polls at the bottom and middle portion of the page. I see that many of you have already answered those uh, questions, so thanks so much. I do have 2 p.m. Eastern time, so what we'll do now is go ahead and get started. First, what I'd like to do is begin with by going over a few housekeeping items related to the webinar. To ensure the best audio experience, the conference has been placed in silent mode. So if you have any issues or you have any questions, what I'd like for you to do is please enter those into the Q&A pod, uh, which is located on the right-hand side of your screen. And right now it's in the lower right-hand side of your screen. This works like a chat. This webinar is being recorded, and it will be posted to both our NASA Online Adobe Connect event catalog, as well as to our NASA Earth Data YouTube channel within a few days of completion. I do plan to provide these URLs to you at the end. All presentation files will also be available for download at the end of the webinar. As far as timing is concerned, the webinar itself is one hour long. We've allocated 45 minutes to the presentation with another 15 minutes for the Q&A period. So after our speaker has finished his presentation, what we'll do next is we'll move to a final set of polling questions, and then from there, we will move directly to the question and answer period. So as I mentioned earlier, you have an opportunity to ask your questions throughout by using the Q&A pod. Questions will not be answered using the raising hand function. This has been disabled. Again, we'll take all questions at the end using the Q&A pod. What I'd like to do next is move to our agenda and speaker introduction. All right. We will start with a brief overview of the OpenDAP Hyrax data server new features and improvements. Next, our speaker will transition to a discussion of user-invoked aggregation and aggregation performance improvements. He'll then transition to user authentication improvements and new features, and finally, opened up server support for web services. It is my pleasure to introduce our speaker today, James Gallagher, who is the Vice President of OpenDAP. James? <coughs> uh, thank you, Jennifer. Um, thank you very much, and, uh, and uh, thanks for all of our attendees for joining. Um, as Jennifer said, I'm going to talk about uh, new features and improvements to our Hyrax data server and uh, how those can make it easier for you to share data with the server. Um, we're going to start out with uh, a brief discussion of aggregation and then move into performance improvements that we made uh, to aggregation and also a new form of aggregation that we've introduced recently into the data server. And that's a, user-invoked or user-driven aggregation. Uh, we'll also be talking about support for authentication that's been added to the server. And in particular, these are things like <clears throat> OAuth 2 and LDAP uh, authentication protocols. And last, we're going to talk about the server's support for other kinds of web service protocols. Um, this work was primarily supported by a grant or a contract with Raytheon. Some of the work was also supported by a grant from the Australian National University. <clears throat> Let's talk about aggregation to make sure that, um, that we're all sort of on the same page here. So first of all, when, when I talk about aggregation, I'm talking about combining discrete granules, which are, are really files. And the reason that the files are separate the reason that the granules have been broken out into separate files is usually because of the mechanics of either collecting or processing the data, not an inherent um, notion of distinction in, among, in the data set itself. In fact, users oftentimes have a, t have a view of data that large collections, 10,000, 20,000 files maybe, are actually a single data set. So the idea is that server aggregation frees users from having to understand an archive's exact structure for a data set, and instead lets them look at it in the way that they logically think about it. Um, there are several different techniques that you can use to achieve this aggregation. 
um, idea. And one of them has to do with really regular data, um, data that correspond essentially to NASA's notion of level three data. And, uh, and I'll define in, in a slide in a moment exactly what I mean by regular data. Another kind of data that you might want to aggregate are swath data, satellite swath data. And that, of course, you know, that's level two data or level one B data in the NASA classification. Those are really different from regular data. So in order to see that difference, let's take a look at what I mean by, in quotes, regular data. Um, over here, on the, uh, in the upper left, you can see six granules of a three by four array. Each granule has a three by four array in it. And we can aggregate those using one of two schemes. In the scheme that's in the lower section of this slide, all six granules have been put together to make one large two-dimensional entity that's 18 by four. In the scheme that's shown over here on the right-hand side, the six granules have been put together to make a three-dimensional result. So these, are, these two techniques work because each of the data values in each discrete uh, granule match up in position. So you can use this, uh, you can use a language called NCML to specify these two kinds of aggregation. And this aggregation technique is also available in some other data servers that are open to, open to app servers like the Threads data server. Um, when, we come, when we take a look at swath aggregation, we'll see that there's a really different uh, sort of layout of the data within a granule. But first of all, let's, um, let's continue on and talk about the performance improvements that we've achieved for these regular aggregations. Before I get into the sort of the engineering slides with the graphs and everything, um, let's just talk about the user's perspective on these changes and how they might affect how users work with data. Suppose a user were to be working with a, a relatively small aggregation of 120 files. Now, in most cases, real aggregations are larger than this. But this happens to be sort of our test data set that we use to measure our, our improvements, the magnitude of our improvements. And if the user were to ask for all of the data from this aggregation, it would take the server, a, it would have taken the server, rather, about 26 minutes to complete the response. And during that time, it's most likely that the server would time out because network connections are set to time out after only a few minutes of inactivity. Um, the new server begins streaming the results back to the client within less than a second. Even though the result is extremely large, the data begins to flow right away. So the time, network timeout issues that were a problem in the past are no longer a problem. Suppose that we look at the actual effective transfer rate of this 166 gigabyte result. The original server had an effective rate of about five megabytes per second. And after our improvements, we bumped that up by about a factor of seven, so that it's got an effective transfer rate of about 33 megabytes per second. Of course, you understand that this is sort of a weak statistic because it has everything to do with the actual network situation that a particular request is up against. But we did these tests uh, within machines that are inside the Amazon cloud to sort of normalize the network differences from run to run although they were actually pretty significant between runs. Anyway, the other thing that a user would notice right away, well, actually, the, the end user probably wouldn't notice this, but the people running the server would certainly notice this. The amount of memory that the server requires to build and return the result is reduced, in this example, by four orders of magnitude. That's a factor of 10,000. And what that means is that if several users make the same request, the server is able to handle that. Whereas before, the server, unless it had significant internal memory holdings, probably could not have completed the request. So the key point to take away is that while we've given these, while we've talked about the performance improvements in sort of quantitative terms, they're fundamentally qualitative. 
because the server can handle requests now that it simply could not handle before. And the other thing is that we'll see in the next few slides that these results scale very well to much, much larger requests. So let's take a look at the sort of the engineering uh, graph. So again, remember, these graphs were, were things that we prepared as we were looking at the effects of various algorithmic changes in the way we built these responses. And so we looked at um, what is the initial response time as we vary the number of granules. And what you see here in, uh, in, these, in this sort of a pink section here is that the original code memory requirements spiraled up as the number of granules increased. But our improvements have this flat lining at essentially the memory requirements for the smallest atomic unit of data that will be, that will be uh, assembled by the aggregation. What that means is that as the number of granules gets very, very large, the memory requirements stay essentially constant. Similarly, um, we can take a look at another picture of, actually, you know what? <laughs> um, this is the response time. I'm sorry, I got ahead of myself here. This is the response time. And this graph shows that the response time remains constant as the number of granules get larger. I'm sure that if you guys could speak, you probably would have interrupted and corrected me there. Um, here, we take a look at memory use, finally, and see the same essential picture. As the number of granules varies or the number of variables per granule vary, where we saw before increasing needs for the old server, the new server is essentially constant with respect to the smallest unit of, of the aggregation. So let's take a look at SWAS data, and we'll make our pointer go away. Um, SWAS data is very different from the regular data, the level three data that we worked with in the aggregations described by NCML. In SWAS data, different granules are different sizes. They cover different parts of the globe. And within the granule, uh, at some levels of data, the sort of pixels mean different things. We came across a use case that was presented to us by the developers of the Earth data search client. And what they needed was a kind of user-driven aggregation. So let me describe this in general. And then I'll talk about the Earth Data Search Client use case in specific. So in user-driven aggregation, the client provides a list of data sets to aggregate. Now in the previous aggregations, the regular aggregations, those are defined by the data provider. And remember, those sort of provide a logical view of a data set that a user would expect. But in this case, the client application provides a list of granules to the server and says, aggregate these for me. Uh, the aggregation service is implemented using a new web interface that we specifically designed to be easy to customize. Because this was designed originally, or implemented and designed and implemented, for a specific use case for a specific client. But we realized it was actually a much more general idea. It was intended initially for SWAS data, but it can actually be used with any collection of data sets. And because of its implementation, it can get data from thousands of different granules. And it can, and it can package up those results so that they can be sort of accessed using a single link from a web page. The real drawback to user-driven aggregation is that um, the real drawback to user-driven aggregation is that clients have to know the granules that they want. They have to understand which granules are held by a data server. So there are two basic mechanisms of user-driven aggregation that we've implemented, and they correspond to two different algorithms. The first one is to iterate over a set of granules, apply a constraint to each, collect the discrete results in different files, and then archive them, returning a single archive file. So the user 
gets back an archive like a zip or a tar gz. And when they open that up, there are multiple files in there. Each one of those contains some subset of the information they wanted. In the sec second algorithm, we iterate over a set of granules and transform those granules into a table. And then from that table, we select a subset of the rows by value. So that's very similar to the SQL select notion. Obviously, taking a set of granules and transforming them into tables is something, is something that has its limitations. And I should also point out that while I use the word table here, actually what we're using are DAP sequence uh, variables. And then in the end, we turn them into a tabular representation. So um, as I said before, this aggregation interface is implemented as a web service. And this web service relies on POST so that it can ac accept a much larger set of inputs, um, sort of like a constraint in a way, um, but a much larger input than HTTP GET would typically allow. What this means is that the web service takes a series of commands, the first of which describes the response. And in a sort of an object-oriented sense, the, the response format determines the algorithm that will be used to form the aggregation, whether you iterate over the files and build up a zip archive, or whether you transform all the files into a single table and subset the rows. Depends on the response format. I'll have examples in a moment. Following the response format is a list of, of n data sets modified by constraints. You can either list one constraint and have it apply to all the data sets you list, or you can pair data sets and constraints together, applying a different constraint to each data set that you list. As I said at the very beginning, this is driven by a, uh, by a use case from the Earth Data Search client. What was happening is they were receiving uh, search requests from people, and the responses to those contained thousands of granules. And what they wanted was to not provide somebody with a page that has a thousand links on it. You know, you click a thousand times, and that gets sort of boring after a bit. What they wanted was to have the entire response be available with a single clickable link. And that's exactly what this service provides. It provides a new interface to Hyrax that makes that, that realizes that idea. I'm going to show three examples. Um, understand that this is essentially a machine interface, right? It's being driven by a piece of client software. And you know, you get something back in your web browser nominally. Um, so this is, not, uh, this is not a graphical interface <laughs> demonstration, but I'm going to show three examples. The first one is, how do you get the server, server's version information? Um, the second one is how you form the first kind of aggregation, how you return data in an archive. And in this case, the things are going to be transformed from HDF4 files to NetCDF3 files en route. And then the third thing is, how you get the same basic data, but instead transferred into values that are essentially returned as, well, not essentially, returned as comma-separated values. So let's take a look at the first example. So right in the previous slide or so, I said that this interface uses POST. The first example I'm showing you actually uh, shows it running with GET. Here's the URL right here. And it just so happens that the way this is, has been implemented, you can actually supply the arguments uh, right in the URL as with GET. Or you can use POST. So I just thought I would show you that here. And then it returns the typical you know, version response. It tells you that the aggregation interface is version 1.1. And then it tells you this lovely readable XML stuff about the underlying DAP server. Here's another example that's a bit more real. Now we're, now we're using POST because we're making a real request. And here we're saying that we'd like, we'd like this thing to transform all of the granules or data sets into NetCDF3 files, applying this constraint. 
and here are the files we want to operate on. Now I just list three here because it's PowerPoint, right? But um, you can have thousands of granules listed here. And the return, you know, you go in a command line and, and you say unzip this thing, and this is what comes out. Three NetCDF files, all of which have been, all of which clearly come from HDF files, and you can tell which is which matches with which, and um, and they've been subset. Bundled with this collection of PowerPoint slides, in the comments are much more detailed notes about how to run this, where to go on GitHub to get um, these particular files, and and how to, how to run them with curl against a particular OpenDAP server that we have running at test.opendap.org. Here's the third example. This time, instead of getting a zip file that contains a bunch of NetCDF3 files, we're going to ask for comma-separated values, which I'm pointing to right here. These are our constraints. Not only are we going to ask that the granules be limited to a set of variables, but we're also going to make a bounding box request. And what this is going to do is it's actually going to run a server-side function. And for those of you that are familiar with OpenDAP constraints, you'll notice something suspiciously familiar to the constraints that you can supply to the server. In fact, associated with this VAR keyword, you could actually type in an arbitrary OpenDAP constraint expression. But this particular notation is sort of special and, and says, hey, I want you to run this server-side function called bounding box. And again, here are the same three granules. And then here's the result. And what you get back is not a zip file that you then open up and find NetCDF files inside of, but instead you get a table of values. And you know these are the latitudes and longitudes, and these are actually no data markers because that's how it works out. That the first few lines are no data in this example. So um, we spend a fair amount of time talking about aggregations. Let me just summarize this material. First of all, it, for regular aggregations, which I defined earlier as essentially those that are the ones you define with NCML. Aggregation performance has been improved by orders of magnitude. And fundamentally, those aren't really quantitative. They're, they're qualitative improvements, because people can do things that they just couldn't do before. Um, User-driven aggregation is a new feature. And if we go back to regular aggregation and think, you know, regular aggregations are fundamentally defined by data providers. right? But user-driven aggregations are defined by the users, and that's what makes them so powerful. Um, user-driven aggregations work on a wide variety of data types, particularly the one that bundles up a bunch of discrete granules in a single zip file or, net or tar GZ file. Uh, um, and that, you know, the, the power of regular aggregations is that they enable you to use dimensional subsetting to essentially make time-based requests. But the power of user-driven aggregations is that they can work on data that would be impossible to combine using those techniques. So we move on to talk about authentication. So authentication is kind of a yawn topic for a lot of people. Um, it's not really the sort of thing that makes people all excited about being able to satisfy end user requests, but it's really important for organizations. So Hyrax added support for NASA's Earth Data Login, which fundamentally is based on the OAuth 2 protocol. We also have added support for LDAP and Shibboleth. The latter two were provided uh, with a, the funding to do that work was provided by a grant from the Australian National University. Um, Earth Data Login plus Hyrax supports both web-based access and programmatic access. And um, that's really important because of what that means is that the Earth Data Login access works for data analysis tools as well. LDAP also supports programmatic access. Shibboleth, um, if you want to get involved in the protocol wars, doesn't support it very easily. I said it does not, and then I put easily in parentheses. In practice, Shibboleth doesn't really support it. 
but you, you can, if, but if you have to be all precise about it, there are ways to do it. A key thing, though, is each of these things are single sign-on services, and that's why they're so important to organizations, because what that means is that a single database of credentials can be used by many data servers. So it's much easier for an organization to control who is accessing it or how those accesses are logged. And in reality, so this is my understanding of Earth Data Login, and this may be incomplete, but my understanding is NASA, NASA is, at least in part, really interested in who is using what kinds of services, and Earth Data Login makes it easy to track that. So let me talk to you a little bit about configuration. Again, um, this is really important stuff in a sense. Um, so even though end users don't see it, it's really important stuff. Um, so what we did was we use Apache and Apache modules to provide the actual authentication software. And the reason we did this, as opposed to writing our own, because you could write your own and just stick it in Tomcat. The reason we did this was we wanted to use open source software packages that were widely used or as widely used as possible with the idea that widely used um, security code is a lot is usually robuster than your own security code. The, the sort of the authentication software stack looks like this. It looks like Apache runs Tomcat, which runs Hyrax. You configure Apache to work with Tomcat using the standard modules that enable that. Nothing, nothing new there. And then you configure Apache HTTPD to authenticate using, again, standard modules. All of this is documented on our website in considerable detail. So it's essentially a cookbook recipe. Let's talk about the programmatic access, because that, that is a little bit different. That's kind of out of the box. OAuth 2 was never intended for programmatic access. It was, it's fundamentally a protocol that's designed to enable users to authorize specific third-party web services to sort of act on their behalf. Um, the classic example is, You've got some pictures that you upload to one website, and you want to authorize another website to be able to access some of those pictures and print them out. Okay, so that's what OAuth 2 is really designed to do. Um, but in order to do programmatic access, what we decided on was to put the username and password in a .NET RC file that's in the user's home directory. Now, security purists will yell about this. You've got to just cover your ears, because the reality is the alternatives aren't that much more secure than this, and this is a whole lot easier for end users. This solution was also the solution that the NASA folks we worked with suggested we go with, because their goals are mostly, again, this is my understanding, and they might correct me on this, their goals were mostly to track users, so they're not absolutely concerned with perfect security, but they want it to be really easy because they want people to actually use it. Um, the thing is that this enables programmatic access, and programmatic access to open DAP servers is important because that allows people to do processing jobs that are periodic, that they've scheduled with cron, so they're not going to be sitting in front of their computer when they run, or batch jobs that maybe run in MATLAB or R that might access thousands of granules and you know, go do this and go do this and go do this other thing. And they don't want to be sitting there typing in their password all the time. They want this sort of single sign-on stuff, but they have to be able to get access to the single sign-on stuff through a program like R, which, you know, the OpenDAP interface to R and MATLAB can't easily pop up a dialog box. I mean, you could try to go to MathWorks and get them to modify MATLAB so it would pop up a dialog box. But, you know, they, may, they might say no. <laughs> they might say no. Okay, so that is a summary of our changes and additions for authentication. And now I'd like to spend the last 10 or so minutes talking about other web service protocols. I'm going to talk about webification and WMS. But I want to point out that everything else 
that I've been talking about here so far is actually a web service. So really, this entire talk is about web service protocols. But I want to call these two particular ones to your attention because they highlight one aspect of web services, which is that those web services provide a kind of a platform for interoperability. And so Hyrax ships with support for webification. That's the pronunciation of W10N. And uh, webification is a specification that was developed at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. Webification uses uh, JSON responses to enable people to build and control user interfaces written nominally in JavaScript. So JSON stands for the JavaScript Object Notation. What this means is that you can fire requests at Hyrax, and it will return these JSON responses. And you could be incorporating them into the software of a JavaScript-based graphical inter interface that people look at. W10N is interesting in particular because it supports navigating collections of data to get navigating collections to get to get data. And it's got this really interesting tree model that extends into granules. So while you're navigating a hierarchy of data in different directories and so on, as you get to a particular granule, you can transition to seamlessly navigating the hierarchy within that granule as if there's no difference between, so in other words, as if there's no difference between the directories that hold the files and the files that hold the variables. And what this means is that you can build all kinds of really neat user interfaces that harmonize these data storage schemes. WMS is a very different take on a web service that supports interoperability or that promotes interoperability, I should say. WMS is an OGC specification. It's been around for a long time now. It's really widely supported. It's pretty widely implemented. It's got a lot of power. What it does, instead of trying to return data values, WMS returns pictures of data, georeferenced pictures, which means it interacts with all kinds of third-party tools that can render these pictures. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to run through a sort of a demo of how you go about accessing these services from a Hyrax. Okay, and so this is Hyrax 1.12.2, and which is running on our server test.open.org, as opposed uh, in addition to other places. And what I've done here is I've navigated to the COAD's climatology data set. It's real simple climatology. You know, you know what a climatology is. Um, and over here. There's a column called Dataset Viewers. And I'm going to click on the Viewers link. And when I click on that link, I go to this page that includes a column of supported web services that can be invoked for this particular granule. And I'm going to go down here, and I'm going to click on the W10N service. And when I go into the W10N service, there's a couple things that you should note. First of all, there's this, this, well, actually, first of all, you should realize that what you're looking at in this particular slide, this screenshot, is not, is not uh, the, um, is not actually the, the JSON itself. But you're looking at a very simple user interface that we have built that looks at these W10N objects and um, and renders them in HTML. Okay, so this is a, this is a very simple interface for the JSON objects, and what we see here are the lists of variables within the granule. We see up here the path name of the granule, and we see over here a little menu that actually lets us look at the JSON that we actually would have gotten back. So this interface is sort of designed for developers in a sense, but it can be used by end users as well. If we click on this link here, we go into the granule itself. And, but you can notice up here, as I was saying before, you can travel inside granules, and it looks just like you're continuing to descend down into the hierarchy. 
Here we see information about the specific variable, its attributes. And over here, we notice that in addition to the meta links, there's now some data links. So there's a link marked JSON, and there's one that I craftily obscured with my big red blob. And there's NetCDF3 and NetCDF4. So these are the different kinds of ways that this W10N service can package up a result and give it back to you. But what we want to look at is, for the most part, the JSON response, because that's really what this, uh, this particular part of the talk is about. Let's look at the JSON response. And so now you see the full-on stuff. This is, actually what the, this is actually what the responses all look like, what's flying around behind the scenes. And, and as I said before, this is primarily intended for to drive machines. At least, well, the actual developers of W10 and might say, might might have a slightly different take on it. But my 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 view is that this is really what it's for. And you can imagine if you were writing a JavaScript interface here, you could say, well, I'm going This is the variable name I'm going to show. This is its data type. These are the data values. And because this is clearly a uh, clearly a longitude. This is clearly longitude. We know it's longitude because of this unit's attribute up here. Um, I'm going to make a map of the world, and I'm going to make it so that the latitude spans the entire globe. And so you can imagine in an AJAX-type uh, application, so you're writing a, a web application in JavaScript that uses AJAX, but asynchronously accessing the underlying server. As soon as it shows a fairly simple view of the data, it says, OK, now I'm going to use W10N, and I'm going to make these asynchronous calls. I'm going to get information about this variable. I'm going to get information about this variable. And as that information comes back, the JavaScript interface is able to populate a display that has more and more detail. And that is a powerful way to enable people to make decisions about the things that they're looking at without sort of wasting their time. Right? So it's a very web-friendly way about, of going about things. We can go back to our web services page. And instead of going down to the, to the W10N service, we can take a look at this Godiva WMS GUI. Now, um, again, sort of blocked out by the, red, by the red circles, is the actual link to the WMS service. So the WMS service, remember, is fundamentally a machine interface. It's not something that's designed for people. So what we've bundled with Hyrax is kind of analogous to the web pages that we bundled for the W10N interface. Um, we bundled a WMS graphical interface, a client for WMS. And that's what you get when you click on this link. And so if we click on this link, this is the page you see. Well, it's actually not exactly the page you see. First, you'd see a page with an empty map. And then, when you click on one of these variables, like sea surface temperature, you would see, after a second or so, this map here. And what this map shows, this is, again, it's a geo-referenced map. So it's a picture of data. And there are controls that you can use over here to change um, you can change from this particular view to a contour plot. And for some data, you can choose a logarithmic scale as opposed to a linear scale. Because this, these particular data have negative values, it, um, this client doesn't know how to make a log scale for that. Well, you know, that's sort of obvious why. But anyway, but the key thing is that this is a technique that can show people pictures of data from a server. Now, the data have to be georeferenced to work with WMS. But you can actually do much more. Because the server shows has not only this client, it actually has the machine interface. We can do other things, like down here. We can open these data in Google Earth. So you could either paste the URL, which is this exciting thing up here, into Google Earth. Or you could click this link. And um, if your browser is configured properly, it'll send you right over to, to Google Earth. And when you do that, what you see is you see these data displayed in Google Earth. And you can layer these data with all kinds of other information that Google Earth can process. This is a, and, and part of the reason that I wanted to highlight Google Earth is I think it really points out the interoperability 
uh, aspect of these kinds of web services like W10N and WMS. The thing is that interoperability is not just things working together. You know, making things that work together is that's like really just competent engineering. But what's happened here is that some things that were never really initially designed to work together have worked together. And that's really what interoperability is about. It's about, you know, the, the unplanned or, or, yeah, the unplanned um, interoperation of tools and data. And that's, that's what you get with this. So um, as I said, uh, the slide stack, the comments for the slides, show you how to do all this stuff if it's not uh, evident. And, uh, and that's the conclusion. I'd, I'd like to say that the presentation itself has been supported by our current contract with uh, NASA Goddard Space Flight Center and Raytheon. And the contract number is right here. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to you, Jennifer. OK, thank you, James. Thanks, everybody. What we're going to do next is we will move to our final set of polling questions. And I will give these questions, uh, because we've got a couple of short answer questions, about three minutes or so. From there, we will follow directly with the question and answer period. OK? So let's give these about three minutes, and then we'll move along to the Q&A period. So be sure to stay in the room and or stay on the line to participate. And we'll be taking all questions using the Q&A pod. Thank you. Just one comment, because I noticed uh, some feedback on one of our polling questions. The slides uh, will be available for download when we get to the next um, layout with the Q&A. Uh, I do have his James PowerPoint available, as well as uh, the presentation in PDF format. So you will certainly have an opportunity to download the presentation or the slides when we have, when we have finished. All right.
Okay, we're going to give these just a few more seconds. Okay, everybody, what I'd like to do next is move to the Q&A period. However, I have noticed that there have been several questions posed within the polling questions. So if it's all right with you, James, it might be um, worthwhile to try to address those questions now before we you know, move along to the Q&A period in the, uh, the Q&A pod. Is that fine with you? Sure, that's great. Okay, wonderful. So let's get started with those. And I'm referring to the polling question that um, is asking what other information about OpenDAP uh, participants would like to know about. And so um, the first question is, uh, is the Godiva GUI native in 1.12.2? And the answer is sort of. <laughs> um, there are two different WAR file, web archive files, that are available um, for Hyrax 1.12.2. One of them does not include the Godiva GUI, and one of them does. So, um, and the reason we split it up like that, actually, I'm not really sure why we split it up like that. I guess one is much smaller or something like that. But, um, but when you install Godiva, one of the things that you have to do is you have to sort of tweak some security things. And so um, my guess is that, that we broke, that Nathan decided to break it down that way so that People could say, oh, well, here's the thing. You just install it, and you don't have to fill it with any security stuff. If you want to configure Godiva and NCWMS, which is the underlying WMS implementation, you probably noticed that as well, um, then you have to do some security stuff. So anyway, so, but it is all available from the website download page. There's nothing special. You don't have to go anywhere else. OK, thank you, James. The next question uh, is, in what scenarios would user aggregation be useful? Ah, well, OK. Fundamentally, the Earth Data Search Client scenario is, is one of the scenarios where it would be useful. I and mean, that's actually what drove the implementation. And um, as far as I know, they're using it, or they plan to roll that out soon. Another case where it would be useful is if we were to bundle an open search client with Hyrax. Open search clients normally return a whole bunch of URLs. And you might want to offer a person the option of saying, you know, I'd like the data for the latitude and longitude variables from every one of these granules. And I know it's going to be kind of a lot, but you know, you're a computer, go. And so that would be great. You could do that, exactly that. The other thing, and I think this corresponds to another comment or question that I see somewhere on the pages here, is that you can combine things together that are not all similarly shaped. So for example, they're different, they have a different DDS in the parlance of, of DAP. You can combine together arbitrary granules. Um, so it would, be, it would be applicable in any scenario where the person wanted to make a single request that bundled together things that otherwise could not be aggregated using the so-called regular aggregations that NCML provides. OK, thank you, James. We will address the two additional questions that were um, included in the polling question response, and then we'll move directly to the Q&A. Um, so the next one is, will this work with a web object storage back end? Hmm, that's a good question. Um, I'm not sure what this exactly refers to. But um, in principle, Hyrax is designed with a modular architecture that abstracts the notion of data storage. So it should work with a web service object uh, back end. But you'll probably have to write some code to make that happen. Uh, we have prototyped. Um, serving data using S3 and Glacier. And I, those would probably qualify as web object storage backends. 
And, um, and so we do have that code. It's prototype. Um, so if you have different, um, different things in mind, you probably would have to do some development. But the, the architecture of the server overall is designed to facilitate that. OK, thank you, James. And then I think you've actually addressed the final question, which was with regard to inconsistent DDS structures. It will be possible in the future to aggregate data when the granules have inconsistent DDS structures. That's true. One of the things that we're looking for feedback on is how we might make that available to, uh, to users, to, to, to users who are client developers or to end users. Right now, the aggregation service is primarily intended to be a machine interface, which is you know, one of the characteristics of a lot of web services. So how do you write good clients that make its capabilities accessible to users? And people you know, have any ideas? You can just drop them to me in an email or whatever. Anyways, but we should get on with the question, the other question. OK, thank you, James. And uh, just a reminder, oh, shoot, I've got the wrong title here. Uh, so the files for today's uh, opened up webinar you can find in the lower right hand corner. If you left click on any of those files, again available in either PDF or PowerPoint, you will be able to, you'll be prompted to um, download the presentation files. And then the second point would be that the webinar has been recorded and it will be posted not only to our online uh, Adobe Connect event catalog, which is located at the tinyurl.com Earth Data webinar, uh, but it will also be posted to our NASA Earth Data YouTube channel um, within a couple of days of completion. So you'll be able to find it there as well. So there were a few questions um, posed thus far, and if anybody has questions, please uh, type those into the Q&A pod. The first one is, um, and it, I think this was in reference to slide number 15, um, is aggregate still part of the URL before the the and being shown? So I'm not sure if I need yeah. to perhaps it, go back to that piece yeah. of your presentation for reference. Um, uh, you may for the uh, for the other viewers, but why don't we do me? that? Because yeah. I had made a note as this um, question was being. I believe it's 15. So bear with me just for a moment, if you would. Uh, I believe that this is the two previous. It, okay. You want to go back to thirteen? There the, you go. Um, yeah, aggregation is actually the name of the service. Yes. And so then there's a slash, and then well here I'll show you with an exciting arrow here. The arrow visible? There it is. Um, this question mark here marks the beginning of the query string in the URL. And then this ampersand marks the first parameter. And again, this is the get form of accessing this particular web service. Subsequent slides um, show it on the they show using post. And uh, so anyways, um, so it's OK, aggregation. so there's actually a series of, of questions and, uh, and, and Comment. So, Siri Joda, I don't know if maybe uh, you know you, you and uh, James may address some of these um, separately offline. But some of the comments were, uh, you know, you cannot constrain one parameter based on another. And then there was a, a link to um, these. Unfortunately, we're not. They, they, I don't think everyone can see these questions. I can see them in uh, I can see them in presenter view. Um, right. Right. All right. And so, um, uh, yes, let's see. I'm just. Ah, well, anyways, um, Siri, Siri Joda's question can I constrain one parameter based on another? Uh, yeah, that is essentially true. Um, yeah, that's right. And that, if that turns out to be something that's important, that's something that we would do by modifying the expression evaluator. Um, there's, no, there's no inherent reason that you couldn't do that. But obviously, you can imagine if you're implementing an expression evaluator, 
uh, there's a lot of performance in, uh, or performance sort of shortcuts that you can you can make if you can say that I will have at most one variable in any sub expression. So, um, so there you have it. Okay. <laughs> Okay, and so the next question, thank you, James. The next question is, where can we find details on how to configure new hierarchs to use new features? For example, aggregations, W10N, WMS, et cetera. So there is information on configuring W10N, WMS, and most of the new features, including aggregation, on our website. So if you go to docs.opendap.org, there is a page that says, you know, Hyrax installation. And there are other pages that link off there. The main page gives the basic installation. This is how you get the RPM files, of which there are now only two. And you know, you install them on your computer and you have to run this back end server and you need to install Tomcat and you need to drop a web archive file into Tomcat and start up Tomcat. So that process is described. And then there are other things that say, if you want to configure authentication, here's a page of documentation about that. If you want to configure WMS, here's a page of documentation about that, and so on. For admittedly, the documentation regarding this aggregation service is pretty thin. It's pretty thin at this point because this work was done for a very specific client and a very specific use case in that client. But as I said, the, the service is so general that um, <clears throat> the service is so general that it, could, it actually is quite powerful. But the question is, we don't really know how people will want to use it. So we're kind of sort of in a chicken and the egg thing. And it would actually be great if people from this webinar wanted to send us suggestions. And you could send suggestions either to me or you could send them to support at opendap.org. OK, thank you, James. The next question is, any plans to include an open in ArcGIS Earth link in the interface so that we can continue to visualize after Google Earth is depreciated? Hmm. Um, that's a good question. We are not actually the developers of the Godiva interface. But that would be a pretty cool idea, huh? Yes. I think that there should be plans. <laughs> OK, thank you, James. I am uh, moving down to see whether or not there are additional questions. Are there any additional questions from any of our participants here? OK, well, I'll give it a couple of minutes and give people an opportunity to think about that. Um, just a couple of points. When we have reached the point where there are no further questions. We will hang up the telecon, but I do plan to leave the virtual meeting space open. If you think of something after the fact, please feel free to type that into the Q&A log. Um, James will receive a copy of the, the Q&A log, so certainly um, any discussion, he can you know, take that up with, with individuals or you know, further discuss offline. He will have the information in front of him. And then for those of you interested in downloading the files, you'll have that opportunity as well. So are, are there any further questions? I'm not seeing anything. Well, I would like to thank everybody for your participation today. And um, of course, you can feel free to email me. Um, and I can forward any additional inquiries to James as well, or you could email him um, directly. Well, thanks so much, everybody. Thanks for your participation. At this particular point, we will log off from the uh, telecon. Oh, you're very welcome. Thank you. All right, bye-bye now. Thank you, Jennifer. Now. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye.